Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, we're lucky to be here. And as I look out the window, window here, it's beautiful. Um, my name's Leah. I am with MasterCard, but I'm actually here independently as a big supporter of CFF. And this topic we're going to talk about with these three amazing leaders here is about the workforce and what we still need to see evolve and change in order to make it um, better and easier for people to get into cybersecurity and as we look at everything that's changing within cybersecurity. I'm also a career transitioner, so this topic's very near and dear to my heart. But I'm going to actually turn it over to let each one introduce themselves and then we'll continue with the discussion. Mark? Uh, I'm Mark Weatherford. I am the Chief Strategy Officer at the National Cybersecurity Center right now, um, but probably more relevant for this. I I'm, was I'm a, been a, a multi-time CISO, so workforce issues have been part of my uh, professional DNA, I guess, for the last 20 years. Um, I was the, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this um, as we get in, but I was the uh, Chief Information Security Officer for um, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger in California, and um, workforce was something that he was very interested in, but the political headwinds wouldn't allow us to do some of the things that, that I wanted to do. Uh, and then I was also the um, Deputy Undersecretary for Cybersecurity uh, at DHS in the Obama administration, where a, a large part of my portfolio um, millions of dollars actually was spent on uh, workforce and education across um, state and local governments um, and uh, collaborating with the private sector as well. Mauricio? Yes, hi, I'm uh, Mauricio Benavides. I'm the founder of a company called MetaBaseQ, uh, focusing in Latin America and going after emerging markets. Uh, this is a very dear topic as uh, I've been, I founded several companies over the years, uh, got into uh, cybersecurity not too long ago, and we saw a huge gap. So as we work with large enterprises, and we look at regulation, and we look at different things, uh, we believe that the foundation is still uh, broken, and there's a huge need uh, around collaboration, private public sectors. And, uh, and it's super interesting to see how you know, we can all work together to start uh, helping out to bridge that gap. Uh, new technologies are coming to the equation, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But uh, it's exciting to, to be here, and, and thank you for the, the invitation. Gordon. Yes, my name is Gordon Pellos, and I'm with CompTIA. How many of you know what CompTIA stands for? Acronym. One hand went up. <laughs> okay, well, CompTIA is the Computing Technology Industry Association. We're the world's largest uh, not-for-profit IT industry association, and we have members from Microsoft, Cisco, uh, to SMBs, tens of thousands of members. Um, over the 42 years that we've been in business, we've trained over 4 million people uh, in, in IT certifications. Uh, we're nearing 1 million in cyber certifications. Uh, that we've issued. So uh, we're, we're very familiar with the challenges. As we look at the cyber world right now, we see over 4 million positions open globally, over 500,000 in the U.S. alone. Uh, we see a great opportunity to help fill that void. Um, the challenge that, that we see today is, uh, we just did a, finished a study last year um, that looked at career intention of people, and again, this was a U.S.-based uh, study. We're a global organization, but this study in particular was U.S.-based, but I think it applies elsewhere. We looked at the career intentions of people that are in the workforce that are looking to career change, or people that were in university or, or college looking at uh, what their uh, career objectives were. And what we found that of the 46 million people that, is, that fell into one of those categories, 13% um, indicated that they were interested in a career in technology. 13% of the 46 million in the US. And then when we took a look at that 13%, it was a, a little over three, approaching 4% that were considering cyber as a career. And so one of the problems that, that I see that we have is that uh, we don't have enough um, candidate pool. We need to increase the candidate pool, uh, people that are interested. And uh, I attribute part of the problem to the, the STEM push that we saw for years 
uh, in America in particular. Um, and, and what that did, you know, it did a lot of good things, but it also did some things to, to young people and to families where they, they said, hey, I'm not smart enough to work in tech. I don't have a strong STEM background. I didn't excel in that in school. And that's, that's a misnomer, that's not true. People can work in tech without a, a strong STEM background. And so, um, you know, we need to a better, do a better job of marketing um, the career opportunities in technology. Um, we need to start with K through 12. We need to work community colleges. We need to work universities and we need to work with employers uh, on upskilling and reskilling uh, to attract people into these jobs. We're definitely going to dive a lot more into what each of these gentlemen mentioned um, in this discussion, but one thing I definitely want to bring up, and as we've been coming off the conversations, the last few conversations around AI, uh, is what is what are your views when it starts intersecting with humans and then the workforce? Um, personally, for me, I, I'm for AI, but I think we have a long ways to go. I think it'll actually help create more jobs. Um, it'll be a matter of different skill sets. I don't think it's gonna eliminate humans necessarily. Um, and I think we need uh, more, you know, the, the uh, better skill sets, different skill sets ra rather when it comes to AI. And I think in some ways AI and automation can help with um, what we're trying to solve for in the workforce. But if each of you can share some thoughts on this. Um, Mark, if you want to start, please. Yeah, so this may be a uh, counterintuitive um, thought, but I, I think, so one, I mean, we, as we see technology advance, it, it always changes the workforce. And, and I think many of us have, maybe not, but I made the mistake. Um, uh, several times during my career of, as technology changed, um, trying to uh, re-educate my existing workforce to match the new technology. And the one thing that comes to mind is early in the cloud days, I thought I could just take all of my, my, my staff and make them uh, move from client server to cloud, and um, it didn't work so well. Uh, you know, there, was a, there was a significant amount of of, of you know formal education, formal training that had to occur there. So I think, um, and we're already starting to see this with Gen AI. You know, with, um, that it is automating so many of the existing tasks um, that we are in fact seeing a a different impact on the workforce than perhaps we have seen in the past, where jobs. Um, certain cybersecurity jobs are truly going away. Um, you know, and I, I've talked with many of my friends um, in the community right now and uh, companies that may have had 20 or 30 SOC analysts on staff, um, you know, they don't need that many anymore. You just need people that can know how to ask really good questions of, of chat GPT, if, if you will. So I think there's going to be um, kind of a rejiggering of uh, of the talent requirements, the, the actual security talent required to run an operation. And that's kind of everything I've, I, I look at everything through the lens of, of operations. How, what does it take me as a CISO to keep my organization running day to day? And I, and I think AI is, is Gen AI, I should say, specifically. Gen AI is um, helping in the short term the longer term, I, you know, TBD. No, all good points, and especially around the SOC analyst, I hear that a lot too. Mauricio, I know you have some um, thoughts around this as well. Yeah, just 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 to complement on that. Now, one of the things that that at least we see is 12% uh, of our workforce never went to school. So I think it goes back to what Gordon was saying. You know, it's like we just need to find that talent. Uh, and sometimes the other ones is you find out, you know, that there's lawyers that want to do something else or there's people that hate their jobs and all of a sudden want to do something. And when you, when you take a step back, it's like there hasn't been any real training. You know, it's like you go out to universities and where are the degrees? You go to 1 to 12 and what do you see books talking about cybersecurity? You never do. So I think it's an interesting thing. And, for example, one of the things on AI... I think the world is going to move towards that direction no matter what. It's going really, really fast. 
I think it's just more on how we're going to use it and how we're going to complement it. No, when uh, the phones came out, people were thinking, well, now the apps are just going to take a lot of things out, and just a totally completely new industry came out of it. You know, people started building apps, people started downloading apps, started looking at it. So one example on how we're utilize, uh, utilizing AI. We, we did a, a cybersecurity academy free for students so we can attract talent to it. And one of the things that we, we're discovering is obviously everybody has different levels and we're starting to use AI so we can train per person and based on their maturity level, you can bring the, the specifics up. You know? So yes, as Mark is saying, the SOC might change roles, but we also got to remember that the attackers have all these tools, they have unlimited budgets, and they're growing really, really fast. So we just need to make sure that we understand how do we capitalize and use AI and bring it quickly into our operations. And the tough thing, I think, is having the right people in place on our, your R&D labs or in different places where we can set up a base where the rest of the people can use and help bridge that gap as we're talking about how do we train people faster in a way that they don't feel that, oh, I don't want to touch it because it's too complicated because there's too many aspects on it. And with AI, you can actually get there so they feel comfortable that they're at the right level and they're getting you know, better and better and better. So. Thank you. And Gordon, especially given your organization as uh, training and putting information out, where do you stand on this? Yeah, I think it reminds me of a, a saying I, I heard last year. Um, AI won't take your job. A person using AI is going to take your job. And, um, and that was really in the context of prepare yourself. Um, if you sit back <clears throat> and ignore it, um, you'll, you'll become um, out, of, out of a job. So I think there's, a, there's great opportunity here. There's new jobs being created, prompt engineers, um, jobs that didn't exist a year or two ago. Um, so we need to think in, in, in that context. And um, I think there's great opportunity. We're seeing um, some of our uh, higher learning partners modularize their education into bite-sized components. So they're taking generative AI training courses and making them essentially disposable because they, they understand that it's evolving so quickly what they designed for today will be um, out of date in six months or a year. So, so they're starting to understand that this atomization of the education material, uh, enabling people to be trained just in time and, and apply um, AI to things like assessments of what people's needs are, are critically important so that they're training them on exactly what they need and not wasting their time. So, you know, as you look at a, say, example of a four-year degree program, there's a bunch of things in there that are, um, a person may already know or may, may be redundant if they've been in the workforce. So assess their ability, what their needs are, and train them just on those specific things. So there's great ways to use it, but will it replace people? No. Not, and perhaps 20 years out, 10 years out, maybe, but not today. Thank you. So you all touched on um, you know, how the di different skill sets will need to be applied, how it won't necessarily replace humans, but how we need to train humans to help with the you know, as we go further within AI and the tools that we use and um, the governance around it. But when you think about all the people that are out there that still want to get into the industry in cyber, and I do, I mean, some of us hear the talent shortage, which I completely disagree with that, and I think it's BS, <laughs> um, because there's plenty of people out there who want to get in. So when you think about from an organization or a company to the hiring manager to HR to um, the way that it's done today, you know, from continent to continent, to try to get people in or to try to hire candidates that are skilled or, um, you know, there's even the very high uh, unrealistic expectations when it comes to adopting and um, grooming that talent to break in. Well, if you can talk a little bit about what are some ways and ideas that you have or things that you've done to help that along, um, especially, you know, how, do, how we position or market it today and do we need to change there as well? Um, Mark, we can start with you. Well, <clears throat> I think there's a, mm, there's a difference between the public sector and the private sector. And at least in the United States, I think there, there is a, I wouldn't call it an expectation mismatch. 
Um, but there's a um, there's a maybe a, a skill mismatch or a skill misunderstanding is probably a better way of saying it, where uh, many government organizations still have these very archaic um, kind of uh, guidelines for hiring people into technical positions like cybersecurity. Um, and I can just, from my own experiences, one of my big frustrations working in the federal government was um, the limitations around the kind of people that I could that I could bring in. And I think, you know, to one of the points that was kind of made on uh, a couple times here is um, I think we focus a little bit too much, perhaps, um, or we give too much airtime, perhaps, to having a college education um, with, the, with that focuses on cybersecurity and less on the hands-on experience um, that, that I can put to work today. I mean, even, and you know, we've all seen this over and over and over again, even somebody that comes out of uh, college with a 40 degree in cybersecurity or computer security or operational management or, or statistics or whatever it may be, they're not, productive on day one. Um, if I took the same person that spent the past four years um, interning or working, I can make them productive on day one. So there's a, there's a different, I think, a misunderstanding of, of skills that are required to be proficient in our, in our business. Um, just hit on it really quickly. I think um, it's, it gets, again, it's a, it's a change in the culture, too, again, at least in the United States. Um, kids are growing up now much more savvy than they, did, than they were just a few years ago. So even um, in, we work with, at the National Cybersecurity Center, we work, do a lot of K through 12 education. And I find that some of these, you know, K through 6 kids are really savvy. I mean, they understand, they don't understand the intricacies and the details of, of what cyber operations mean, but they understand the difference between bad and good. And so I think that in the longer run, that, that, that is going to change the culture and it's going to make it easier for us as these, these people come into the workforce. Thank you for that. Mauricio, thoughts? Yeah, so, so, so one of the things that we're seeing in, in Latin America is, and it, it happens, I think, everywhere, where somebody wants to learn and is passionate about something, they quickly come up uh, and learn about different things. You know? uh, we do believe in what we're seeing, that you need the private, the public, and the global collaboration, because the threats are the same everywhere. Just the level of maturity of the companies is different. So you, you hear all these global corporations like focusing on you know the US or Europe or but what about the rest of the world no you're deployed in Asia in Africa in in Latin America and it's like you could have a no you're you're as strong as your weakest link right so if in your infrastructure you have something that's you know not as strong somewhere else then you're always going to be weak no matter what you do anywhere else so why, why am I saying that it's, it's the private, the, the, the public, and, and the global collaboration? Because I mean, we've been talking about it that you need to start early on. I think we underestimate the new generations because they're coming very savvy on things. I mean, I was very surprised, and I'm very surprised to see uh, people that don't go to school that quickly pick up on things, and that's the type of people you need protecting because that's how the attackers are. You know? the, the organized crime in, in, in Latin America, for example, is huge and they get kids that are 10, 12, 14 years old, they start paying them and they become super savvy. And that's what we're facing all of our issues against. So how do we quickly, using AI and other type of tools, help identify that talent, uh, train them, and help in a global perspective and on that collaboration to take it to a next level? And you were asking about the skill sets. I mean, one of the biggest issues is people don't even know what they're hiring for. You know, it's like you go to HR and it's like, okay, we need a cyber guy. And, uh, you know, our customers calls us, it's like, what does that mean? Who should I be looking for? What type of experience? I never find anybody. Only the banks have them. And there's like five guys. And they, they get fired because they don't know and it's not their fault because they've never been trained. But then the other guy in desperation hires them again. So I think there's a lot of opportunities that we all need to work together and collaborate 
to ensure you know the, the, the global protection is there. And again, we're going against attackers that have unlimited budgets, and you know they get people early on, and they don't care about who's doing what. They're like, let's just go after the the weakest link, and they quickly go after it. Yeah, and all these attackers have college degrees so. yeah. <laughs> or well, certificates, exactly. five of them. <laughs> uh, so, Gordon, your thoughts here. Yeah, so this, I love this question. I wrote an article that was published in Forbes a week ago. Maybe it was two weeks ago. I'm losing track of time. But it was five pathways to a career in cybersecurity for HR managers. And it was really um, targeting the fact that a lot of these HR managers that are doing the recruiting on behalf of the organization or the recruiters, they don't understand what they're looking for. And, and, and often what they will do is fall back on the degree as a proxy for the skills, and they may hire a, a person with a degree in cybersecurity. And I, I think I told the story the other night to a couple of the folks about a young lady that had a degree in cybersecurity from a, uni a large university, and she failed our entry-level cybersecurity Security Plus exam three times. And she was posting on LinkedIn, Yahoo, I finally passed. Um, but she had a degree in cybersecurity. She should have been able to um, pass a entry level um, certification. So I, I think back to the point um, that a piece of paper doesn't mean anything. It's, a, it, it's about skills. And so we really need to find ways to help these organizations understand how to recruit people that have the skills matched or married with the experience to be able to be, become productive if we, um, if we really are serious about solving these problems. Back to um, uh, the other point that was mentioned here, we're working with some organizations like ICSI in San Antonio, which is a independent school, uh, Northeast Independent School District in San Antonio, who bought a Walmart store and have converted it into a cybersecurity education center, start, starting in grade six with cyber warriors in grade nine, they take uh, CompTIA um, IT fundamentals. In grade 10, they take Security Plus. In grade 11, Networking Plus. And in grade 12, a Cisco CCNA. These kids are graduating from high school, able to more, make more money than their parents make um, in San Antonio. Um, and one of the things we're trying to promote as, as a leading not-for-profit is why are we not doing this in other cities? And um, so we're, we've launched something uh, called um, um, essentially uh, a tech city competition that, that's encouraging um, government, um, business, and academics to come together uh, to support um, initiatives like this in communities to enable these young people to get those, those trainings and certification. And it's important that they learn that these jobs are uh, available, approachable, and fun. Um, and this is the way to do it, start them young, uh, start them in grade six, grade nine. Yeah, I, I want to just, you know, we, we've talked a lot about skills and, 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 and obviously they're very important. But you just said fun and this gentleman right here, i sorry, I forgot your name earlier. He talked about fun. You know, I think all of us who got into this business, we got into it because it was fun. We really, it, I mean, we're passionate about doing it. And to your point, when you're passionate about doing something, you're willing to devote the time to become really good at it. Um, I know that's why I got in this business 30 years ago, because it was fun. I mean, it was exciting, and it was kind of like being a fireman. You know, you run to the fire. Um, and I tell people that all the time. You know, if you're not willing to run to these, to these cyber fires, you're probably in the wrong business. Yeah, and I think, too, around the messaging, right? We do have to make it, it is fun, it can be, and we need to make it far more inclusive and open and, incur and you know, from my perspective, yeah, a lot more females need to come in. Yeah. So how do we change how we communicate, message, market, open that up and help every one of us in all the different roles? And, well, simply yep. dropping the degree requirement yeah. will do that. Uh, you know, the numbers uh, show you that, you know, white privilege has, you know, enabled uh, the majority of the white population in the U.S. go to university where um, um, diverse uh, individuals have less opportunity. So, you know, if we can encourage employers to start to look at diversity and, uh, you know, that added uh, cultural benefit that they get by having diverse population um, joining their, their workforce, it'll, it'll solve a number of those problems. Yep. I have a really funny story. <clears throat> 
when I was at DHS, some of you remember Howard Schmidt, you know, God rest his soul. Um, Howard's a wonderful guy. He was the cyber czar in the White House. And uh, I was giving the keynote at, at DEF CON in Las Vegas. And, and I, you know, there's like 5,000 people in the room there. And I said, I don't care if you have a college degree. I'm looking for good experience. Come and see me after this, and um, after, after my talk. And uh, five minutes later, my chief of staff had gotten a phone call from Howard Schmidt saying, do you realize how much the federal government spends on um, scholarships for higher education? And you just told everybody that they don't need to go to college. And uh, I, so I got kind of called on the carpet and called to the woodshed uh, at the White House um, for that. Well, you're still here, though, to talk about it. <laughs> Mauricio, I think you were going to no, say I, something. I, I, was, I was exactly going to say what, you know, it, it's like if people think about certifications, and yesterday and today I've been talking to a bunch of very large companies, and they're like, we don't understand cybersecurity. We just comply on regulation. So we, we buy the checkbox, uh, you know, it's like the tools that they told us to buy, we, we, we put somebody there, and that's it, no? And I think... Uh, the, the mindset by eliminating some of those things, our company has 48% of women, which is super interesting because Latin America, 48% of women. And when I first got into this, it was weird because it's like, oh, I'm going into IT now. And IT is like also pretty male oriented. And I quickly discovered that has nothing to do with IT. So I think in a way we need to like separate ourselves from an IT culture that's been running for many, many generations, because people say, oh, the IT guys are mainly male, no? And, and again, I think this is a very sophisticated industry, which is super fun and passionate. It's changing rapidly, it's just starting, now AI is bringing another component. And I think any gender, any person, anybody that has talented should be passionate and just learning about it. Yeah, absolutely. So as we wrap up in the few minutes we have left, and in the spirit of, collaboration with everyone in this room who are from various backgrounds and places in the world when if you two perspectives um, or a perspective and an ask for this group um, going into next year if you can one share um, how we can more collectively leverage the business models that are out there that have been effective at making these advances in the workforce and then two what's your ask of the room here that we can start working on in, in the next 12 months so when we reconvene we have some um, updates we can share that have moved us forward I don't know if I know how to answer that question <laughs> um, I think you know w one thing is and, and anybody who's been a CISO or uh, a cyber executive anywhere. It seems like one of the, it, when, when budget cut times come around, the first thing you cut is training. Um, and I mean, it's just, it just is. I, you know, I don't like it, I've done it. I, but I, so I think we need to, um, our organizations, whether you're, again, whether you're public sector or private sector, need to uh, prioritize skills and training um, as much as they prioritize buying new technology. Um, because that workforce is, in fact, the future of your organization. So, um, and again, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, everybody understands that this is necessary, but it's still, it still seems to happen over and over again that, that budget, when budget, time, budget cuts come around, um, training is the one thing that goes away. Um, I would say the, the other thing, and again, we talked about it, I am, I am giddy with excitement over um, Gen AI and the difference it's gonna make in our organizations um, and the ability that, that it's going to up-level um, our ability as security technologists to do our job better. Thank you, Mauricio. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the two takeaways, I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to do a lot of event type of hackathons where we're pushing the public sector to invite anybody in the public that wants to participate. And then also on the private side, any private universities, uh, private companies, just, just to get the word out there and just to, to show that this is not a boring industry, but the opposite. So just to get people and, and start finding talent. 
so I think I think that that's one of the things that we want to do this year a lot to try to find you know tons of uh, people that are passionate about this industry that we can identify where the talent is and then try to bridge the gaps between companies and uh, and talent and then number two is I mean we're in Davos I think uh, the WEF is every year taking this more seriously the cybersecurity hub um, it's 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 getting some interesting momentum. Uh, some of the people here participate on it. I think there's a lot of really interesting things happening there. Uh, articles are coming out, things are coming out, and we should try to push and leverage all that, you know, to, to, to drive that global collaboration, because as I was saying, it's not by region, it's not by country, it's not by company, it's, it's, it's a big threat globally. You know, it's like we're going against a huge number of attackers over a trillion dollar industry, uh, unlimited resources, and that should be our focus. So we should push the WEF to do more and more and, and see how we can continue bringing uh, you know, our learnings from other places. Gordon, parting thoughts and your ask to the group. Yeah, I, I think that um, my ask is think about skills versus schools. Um, I know I talked to a lot of executives and I, I, I recall a conversation recently with one that said, yeah, that might be our corporate policy, but I've never hired anyone without a degree. Uh, the degree gives me an assurance and a, um, of, of a certain level of competency. Well, that may be true. It certainly isn't a, 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 a certification of skills. It's a um, you know willingness and having the, the ability to pay for four years of university. Um, so so that that's key. The, the second thing um, I would say is. Uh, you know, we need to do a better job of communicating the fact that the jobs in um, cybersecurity and tech don't require that degree, that people can do it with, uh, they can be self-paced, they can come through in a, a, an associate program, they can go to a community college, they can take a one-year um, certification program, they can do a boot camp. Uh, there's so many different ways for the people with the aptitude, the attitude, the desire, um, and, and the willingness to work hard. And, um, you know, that, that's the message I'm trying to get out to everyone, and I encourage you to spread that to, uh, to attract people to help us solve this 4 million person um, gap that we've got today. And uh, some of the uh, prognosticators are saying that the gap is going to double by the end of the decade. And, if, you know, we're sitting here um, at the end of the decade with 8 million open positions. I think we'll, we'll have a huge problem ahead of us. I do really appreciate your perspectives and your sharing, and I'm going to go with, instead of top three, top two, maybe that's more manageable, but skill sets, right? Skill sets and training, keep that going, increase it, um, don't cut it, and the collaboration and bridging the gaps that we need to do collectively um, with everyone in this room um, across the world. So I want to say thank you to Mark, Mauricio, and Gordon for um, coming up here, as well as to all of you, and of course to Val and all of CFF. Thank you. Thank you.